Why, hello there! My name is Kenji Dick. And I'm Gabby Taylor. And this is Wittenberg Radio. It is episode 123, and it is October 29th, 2018. On this episode of the show, we talk to Marnie Clausen about her latest post on the Wittenberg door. And we also talk to Danielle Morton and Sandra Lepke about the difficulties they face helping students move to and move around CMU. And Wittenberg's very own Riley Friesen had Katie McDonald in the studio to ask about her musical career as well as have her perform some of her very own music. But before we get to that, let's talk about upcoming events. On November 1st at 8.30 p.m. in Potker Hall basement, there's going to be a 90s throwback party hosted by the first years. It's going to be radical. On November 2nd at the Laud Odd at 7.30, the Mennonite Heritage Center will be hosting a screening of the film Urban Eclipse, Rising Tides of Kiki Kosibi. And finally, on November 7th at Marpec Commons at 7 p.m., there will be a face-to-face dialogue. The topic of this conversation will be newcomers in Canada. This week in Winnipeg, on November 2nd and 3rd, it is the Crafted Show and Sale at WAG. Also on November 3rd, the Prairie Voices and Blue Stem present Between Friends at Westminster Church. And finally, November 11th is Remembrance Day. On October 17th, CMU's own Marnie Clausen left a note on the Wittenberg door, an open forum board for anyone to post their opinions about CMU and issues related to CMU. Marnie wrote the following. I'm weary. I'm tired because it seems like every few weeks I'm hearing another story about sexual assault, abuse, violence on the news or from friends I love. I'm tired because it seems like every few weeks I'm hearing another story about sexual assault, abuse, violence on the news or from people I love. It's been a few weeks now since Brett Kavanaugh was confirmed to the U.S. Supreme Court, but I still feel sick to my stomach when I think about it. When I think about the women and men around America and the world who see violence justified, trauma puts into power. I told a friend that night that I couldn't see the light and all I could think about was how much I wanted to vomit. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, he said. The sickness is valid. I think we're pretty helpless. I'd love you to prove me wrong. When it comes to Kavanaugh, But I see some light, just a little, a twinkle on the horizon. I guess we just keep going, and keep fighting, and keep witnessing. But the battle is not ours alone. The earth is the Lord's, and everything in it. I hate being afraid because I'm a woman. I hate that I'm afraid to think about one day having daughters. I hate that my sisters have been hurt so terribly. I hate that boys are raised without the option of expressing their sexuality in gentle ways. I hate that my brothers have been taught to hurt, and that the hurt they receive they are taught to suppress. But I love that we are standing up, speaking up, and listening up. I love that hope is abundant, that I've seen the kingdom of God at work in the past weeks through death and trauma. I love there are people who validate my story and invite me to validate others. So I have to hold that all together. And I pray that the powers that be will not last, that there is a greater power in hope and in love and in grace and in forgiveness and in conviviality. And I pray that the powers that be will not last, that there is a greater power in hope and in love and in grace and in forgiveness and in conviviality. Joining me now to talk about her post and what motivated her to make it is Marnie Clausen. Uh, you made a, a wonderful post on the Wittenberg door uh, a few weeks ago today. Um, and so the first thing I wanted to ask you uh, was what motivated you to write this post to begin with? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, so I was, um, I think, along with most North Americans who are on social media, was to some extent following the uh, the Kavanaugh hearings um, down, down south of the border in, in America. Um, and was just very bothered by what I was seeing in terms of um, uh, essentially sexual violence being um, not just validated, but um, but put into power. Uh, and 
Um, I had the yeah I, I heard the news on on that day that that Kavanaugh was was put into the Supreme Court um, and just felt like I was gonna throw up and so I texted a friend of mine and uh, he and I texted back and forth a little bit um, and uh, uh, just sort of a, a little bit of a solidarity kind of conversation uh, talking about like that the sickness is valid um, and then and then he said you know what I think you should put that on the Wittenberg door <laughs> and so and so I sort of edited it down and, and thought yeah this is not really a typical Wittenberg post it's not quite as conversational as it is reflective but it still felt like it was worth saying so mm -hmm. yeah yeah you've already kind of answered this question but like what was kind of your gut reaction to the news of Kavanaugh's confirmation yeah, well, well gut reaction is the perfect phrase because it, it was a gut reaction like I, I I felt physically ill and um that's something I mean I'm I recognize in myself that I'm a very embodied person and I experience my emotions very physically but I know that there are lots of other people who experience that similarly um, and where injustice uh, can sort of root itself right in the gut um, and where yeah yeah where you can just feel sick at the thought of um, violence being put into power so why do you th so yeah I you were kind of talking about this earlier when you're uh, when you're talking about the motivation behind putting up the post um, so why do you think it was important for the student body to see this post on the Wittenberg door yeah, it's a good question. I think I mostly put it up because I needed to say it. And I, I've often found that um, there are things that one person needs to say that it just turns out that a lot of people need to hear. So again, I think I mentioned earlier that it's not it's not really a typical like conversation piece in terms of that. I think at CMU, we often think of conversation as looking a lot like debate. And that's not really what this piece is about. Hmm. Um, but conversations can happen in other ways as well, um, in, in ways of... You know, one person says, this is what I felt in my body when I heard this news and I wanted to throw up. And I think that's valid because I think that's the kingdom of God in my body. And another person says, wow, I never articulated it that way. Thank you for saying that. And that's a different kind of conversation. Um, and so I think I just I had uh, I had a sense that people needed to hear what I needed to say. And so um, and that, yeah, I know that I'm not the only person who experiences injustice in my gut. And so I. Yeah, wanted to just kind of vocalize that, maybe not on behalf of the student body, but in solidarity with the student body. Um, there are a lot of people um, who are part of our little school of 600 students who have experienced sexual violence. And for us to not be talking about this thing that has just happened um, feels like a different kind of violence to me. And so it felt like the, the conversation needed to happen somehow. And I didn't feel equipped to start the conversation in a super like intellectual political way. That's just not my bent. Um, but I felt like I had a voice that could start a conversation. So I took on the role of commuter programming coordinator. Um, there was a there needed to be a bit of a shuffle in the department. Send me an email or find me on Facebook, Danielle Morton CMU. Um, I'd love to chat. I, I really loved getting to work one-on-one -on -one with students, um, which would get to continue in working with the community assistants, but also trying to figure out who the students are that are out there that don't necessarily have a, a natural um, a natural hangout spot like you might if you're living in residence. Um, and to, to make sure that the voices of people who are here a little bit less are heard just as much. A few years ago, the north parking lot, lot A, was actually split into lot A and B. Um, one was on the west half and one was the east half. When that became the, the parking lot for commuter students, that just became lot A, the whole lot. And so commuter students should definitely feel welcome to park anywhere in that lot, especially come winter time to park somewhere where there is a plug. Do you mind just going like a little bit into what gets done for regular maintenance again? So I know annually it has gravel put on it at least once a, t once a year. And at least a couple of times a year, it gets graded so that uh, the, I think typically before the gravel is applied. Um, if for more detail, the the maintenance guys would be either Charles Petcow or Rick Unger would probably know a lot better. 
Do you have a rough idea of how much they have to spend each year just to maintain the gravel? I don't. That's okay. Gravel is definitely not cheap. And all the events that you put on and your committee puts on, where do you get a budget for that? So similarly to student council or um, the various other groups on campus, we get a, a very small budget from um, student fees. We try to do as much as we can within that budget. Um, there's also some ancillary money for student life that comes from donors and other volunteers and, and uh, things like that. Um, but it's also why we sometimes have events where, you know, it, it might cost a nominal amount of money so that we can at least recoup some of the costs. If someone is curious about upcoming events, where and who can they speak to? Yeah, I'm, they can always come to me. In, my office is A11, right behind Shirley at the South Reception Desk. Um, alternatively, you're more than welcome to speak with any of the commuter council. Um, Althea Howard or Matt Parkinson are great reps of commuter assistance. As well, online, you can find us at um, on Facebook. We're a little old school here. Um, CMU Commuters 2018-2019 and CMU Commuters on Instagram. Cool. Cool. Well, thank you very much for your time. Uh, my name is Sandra Lepke. I'm the coordinator of International Student Programs and Accessibility Programs at CMU. A little while ago, I interviewed Danielle about like the parking lot. Oh yeah. And so I wanted to find out how things you deal with students who have accessibility issues sure. about how they manage getting to school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are most people with these mobility issues who come to CMU, like, are they mostly commuters? They have, in my experience, they have been. Before they come to CMU, how do they discuss um, things like getting into a classroom or where they can be dropped off? Uh, every student who registers with accessibility services now that is a voluntary thing you are not required um, to uh, to register with my office um, I have an interview with them and we discuss everything that they might need what is that everything everything well I guess it depends on the person and what their particular needs are um, everything from if there are test accommodations that are needed or classroom accommodations um, what are some of the things that come up with a mobility issue in just because we have mm -hmm. one very old building, mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. century building, and one brand new building? Yeah. You know what? The biggest issue has actually not been around buildings. It has been around, uh, well, oh, no, that's not entirely true. Let me back up. That is one of the issues. The first thing that pops into my head is actually because of our climate, uh, sidewalk clearances and stuff like that is a constant uh, struggle. Uh, that's been one of the things, like we work with uh, facilities and maintenance uh, on a regular basis um, to um, to make sure that sidewalks and doorways are clear of snow, because uh, that can create some major issues for persons who, who use wheelchairs. Um, and then also if there's people on crutches or something like that, icy spots um, that, uh, like as we have students every year our athletes are constantly on crutches. I myself broke my foot a few years ago. When you broke, broke your foot, mm -hmm. how did that help you empathize with students with mobility issues? Oh, I realized it was funny because the facilities people came to me and they were like, so now that you're, you know, like you're the accessibility person, what have you noticed? Like, what can you tell us? And I'm like, okay, you really should talk to people who do this now. Um, I also realized that keeping parking lots clear, which is what the money for your parking passes goes for, just to say it's worth the money when you have like clear parking lots, it's helpful. Well, yeah. mm -hmm. <clears throat> Sorry, Danielle was saying that the money for the parking passes, more than the money that is given, goes towards clearing them. Yes. So I don't even have a budget to help improve prove the parking no. lot. No. And is that because people have mobility issues and mm -hmm. just because you have mobility issue doesn't mean you can't drive. No, 
know if that's true. Would, because of our parking lot, does it discourage students from driving? I don't know. Uh, it's not a conversation that I've ever had with those students. I know that when we have guests, yeah. uh, they have a hard time mm -hmm. because they're not familiar with the campus. Yeah. And they don't know if they can where they can park. Mm -hmm. so if you're not looking for those blue lines, you have no idea mm -hmm. that they're there. We could use better signage. Yeah, plates are constantly on crutches. I myself broke my foot a few years ago mm -hmm. and was on crutches for, oh, I don't know, like full crutches for about four weeks and then in a walking cast for, uh, I don't know, another six. Um, and it's complicated. Like, and mine is little, like I was getting out of it. Um, <laughs> So it's really complicated. But um, some of the other issues we've run into is doors being blocked, uh, access to uh, elevators. We had an issue with an elevator uh, lobby that you might not even be aware that exists. Over, If you go um, up the stairs by D33, have you been in there? Mm -hmm. Okay, we used to have issues with that entire space being filled with instruments. Oh. For, yeah, an outside group kept blocking like and literally the student couldn't get to their classroom um, because they got up the elevator and couldn't get out of the elevator because literally that entire hallway was filled with instruments so that we've worked at that and and I think that's no longer an issue um, there's constantly issues with maintenance of uh, keeping up uh, door openers um, like they just need to be maintained and they do break down um, and we do try to work at them as soon as we find out when they're not being used regularly by persons who actually need them as opposed to someone who has an arm full of books um, or those kinds of things. It sometimes uh, is a challenge to keep them up. Shortly before the recording of this episode, we received a new post on the Wittenberg door. This post is from Nicole Torsky. It is regarding a recent survey published in the DOXA. Nicole says, I am writing in response to one of the survey questions recently published in the DOXA. I found this question to be ill-informed and I feel it encouraged negative stereotypes. The question, should Indigenous Canadians receive more government funding, implies that all Indigenous students receive money from the government, which is untrue, and distracts from the important conversations being held around reconciliation within Canada and on our CMU campus. Yes, the government does supply some money towards reservations and bans. This money is a small repayment for loss of land, resources, and a way of life. Furthermore, Indigenous children receive less funding towards their education compared to their non-Indigenous counterparts. Many reserves in Canada are experiencing a housing crisis, and there is a lack of public health services on reserves. These are just some of the many obstacles Indigenous people face in our society. The Canadian government has long mistreated and ignored Indigenous people and their fundamental rights to be treated as equal human beings. Indigenous people had rich cultural traditions before their land was colonized and stolen. Reconciliation is not about money. The government will never be able to repay the harm and prosecution Indigenous people have experienced by their policies, procedures, and actions. Indigenous people and organizations around Canada are looking to revive their languages, spirituality, and rich cultural traditions. However, their efforts are hindered by insufficient funding and support from the government and Canadian citizens. Reconciliation includes sharing the truth about the harms Indigenous people have faced. It involves action from the government and Canadian citizens to try to right these wrongs and create space for healing for all those affected by Canada's assimilation policy. I feel the question in the DOXA hinders ongoing conversations on campus and in the Canadian society regarding Indigenous and settler relations. When I saw this question in the political survey, as I was filling it out, I was concerned about sharing I was concerned and shared my worries in the comments section and suggested that this question be rethought. However, I was disappointed to see it printed anyways. I am sure those who printed this document did not mean any harm, but harm was caused nonetheless. 
I hope this unfortunate situation can be used as a conversation starter to discuss the complex history and nuisances this issue presents and build understanding and compassion between Indigenous and settler people on campus. There is ongoing efforts and work within CMU to improve these connections and encourage these important conversations, and I am very grateful for everyone's hard work. I feel passionately about this issue because I would like to see these efforts be continued and expanded. P.S. If you would like to learn more about this topic, I suggest reading A Knock on the Door, The Essential History of Residential Schools from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, edited by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. Or you can take CME's class on Indigenous Peoples of Canada. It is very interesting and informative. Here we go. <laughs> This ain't anything close to love This ain't anything to me This ain't fair to you or me and we know it This ain't fair to you or me and we both show it And I really know what's good for me This probably ain't Trying to detach myself, I'm closer every day. But you say, don't kid yourself, my darling. This is just the end of a good love. But I remember hanging out in my kitchen on the countertops. Got so lost in this conversation, missed the delivery guy. I said, baby, I don't care. Let's hit the sidewalks and go from there. But this ain't fair to you or me, and we know it. And this ain't fair to you or me, we both show it and I really know what's good for me this probably ain't trying to detach myself while I'm closer every day but you say don't kid yourself my darling this is just the end of a good love This ain't fair to you or me, and we know it. This ain't fair to you or me, we both show it. And I really know what's good for me, this probably ain't. Trying to detach myself while I'm closer every day. You say, don't kid yourself, my darling. This is just the end of a good love. So my name's Katie. Um, yeah, I'm a singer-songwriter. I like to write songs. Right, <laughs> That's good. what I do. Uh, yeah. All right. Yeah. Perfect. And uh, can you tell me the name of the song and a little bit about the song itself and kind of mm -hmm. how you came up with the idea of writing it? Sure. Um. Yeah. So. I think songwriting is like a different process every yeah every time I sit down to write a song it kind of turns out like a different process I don't know if I have a particular kind of way of, of doing it but um yeah I guess this one um oh what can I tell you about it um yeah this is like I guess a fairly new one that I wrote in the summer um and yeah basically like I was just kind of playing around with um with playing in drop d I'm like writing more and more songs in, in drop d which is kind of fun and um just honestly like yeah i don't even know how my songs come about i kind of will just be playing around on guitar and start singing a melody and um usually i'll come up with lyrics um 
just sing something random and come up with a theme and kind of later develop them but yeah so yeah yeah and uh about how long does it usually take for you to write music as well or like if you're planning on it like is it with depending on like if it's just a song to song basis or if it's like for an album that kind of thing right yeah um I don't know. I think I've like come to learn that I need to I need to sit down every day to to kind of to write and to just make myself do that. And um, I think it depends for every song. Like sometimes I'll write one and and have it out in an hour. And other days, like I'll write I'll write a few lines and then come back to it. And like I might not finish a song for like a month or two, and it just kind of like happens eventually. Or mm -hmm. yeah. So it depends. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And is this song part of a particular like album, or is it just kind of like a more of a one-off single? Just kind of a, yeah, just like a song. I haven't recorded it yet or really done much with it. Um, but yeah, just a song about emotions and relationships and feelings. <laughs> And that brings an end to our episode. Thank you once again for listening to Wittenberg Radio. Remember to check out all the awesome events that are going to be happening around CMU campus these next couple of weeks, as well around in the city of Winnipeg. My name is Kenji Dick. And I'm Gabby Taylor. And we'll see you next time. Wittenberg Radio is a production of CMU Student Council. The views and opinions expressed by hosts and guests are not necessarily those of CMU Student Council.